Welcome back to Larry King Live with Mark David Chapman. Mark, will you relive with us those uh, terrible moments for you, for the world, for a lot of people uh, around and in circles close to John Lennon? What happened that night? Well, if you want to pick it up from the night, um, I was standing there with a gun in my pocket. Knew you were going to shoot him? So, sorry? Knew you were going to shoot him? Absolutely. Okay. Tried not to, praying not to, but knowing down deep it was probably going to come to that. Did you know it would be that night? Did you know you would see him again? Yes, I knew that morning, oddly, when I left the hotel, I, I had some type of premonition that this was the last time I was going to leave my hotel room. I hadn't seen him up to that point. That's what makes it interesting. I wasn't even sure he was in the building. And then uh, I left the hotel room, bought a copy of The Catcher in the Rye, signed it to Holden Caulfield from Holden Caulfield, and wrote underneath that, this is my statement, underlining the word this, the emphasis on the word this. I had planned not to say anything after the shooting. Walked uh, briskly up Central Park West to 72nd Street and began milling around there with the fans that were there, Jude and Jerry, and uh, later a photographer that came there. Okay. I, uh, and then John came out that day, right? He came out, I was uh, leaning against the uh, gargoyle studded railing and uh, was looking down. I was reading The Catcher in the Rye and uh, I believe he got into a taxi and disappeared. And then uh, later that day, uh, I had gone to lunch with, I believe, Jude. We came back. With who? With Jude. She was a fan there that uh -huh. uh, was there at the building. And uh, we struck up a conversation about Hawaii, about John Lennon. She'd been there a number of times. And at one point during the day, um, she had left. And uh, John came back out. I don't remember him going back in from the taxi, but he was obviously back in the building. He was doing a, an RKO radio special. And he came out of the building and the photographer that I mentioned earlier, Paul Gorish, he kind of pushed me forward and said, here's your chance, you know, you've been waiting all day, you've come from Hawaii to have him sign your album. Go, go. And I was very nervous. And I, I was right in front of John Lennon there instantly. And I had a black Bic pen. And I said, John, would you sign my album? And he said, sure. Yoko went and got into the car and he pushed the button on the pen and started to get it to write. It was a little uh, hard to get to write at first. And then he wrote his name, John Lennon, and then underneath that, 1980. And he looked at me, as I mentioned earlier, he said, is that all? Do you want anything else? And I felt uh, then and now that he knew something subconsciously that he was looking into the eyes of the person that was going to kill him. How do you, why do you think that? Well, his wife was in the car, the door was open, and he's a busy man. He's going to go to a radio, uh, or to his record studio, and he's talking to a nobody, just sign an album for a nobody, and he's asking me, is that all I want? I mean, he's given me the autograph. I don't have a camera on me. What could I give him? I would admit that is a strange thing to say. All right, so he leaves. Right? Yes, he leaves. And what car. do you do the rest of the day? I stand around uh, like an idiot waiting for him to come back. And what time did he come back? He came back about 10 to 11 at night. Had you eaten dinner? No, I had not. Fear you might have missed him? Probably. Knew you were going to shoot him? Yes. How did that happen? What happened? Well, the photographer left. I, in all fairness, I have to say, I tried to get him to stay. Uh, because? There were, those, there were those that felt that I wanted him to shoot pictures of the shooting, which is not true. Why then did you want I, him to stay? I wanted him to stay because I wanted out of there. There was a part, a great part of me that, that didn't want to be there. I, I asked Jude, the fan, before she left for a date that night. She said no. If she'd have said yes, I would have been on the date with her. But you might have killed um, him the next day. I, oh, yes, yeah, I would okay. have probably come back. The circumstances of the killing, what happened? I was sitting at the inside of the arch of the Dakota building, and 
It was dark. It was windy. Jose, the doorman, was out uh, along the sidewalk. And here's another odd thing that happened. I was at an angle where I could see Central Park West and 72nd, and I see this limousine pull up. And as you know, there's probably hundreds of limousines that turn up uh, Central Park West in the evening. But I knew that was his. And I said, this is it. And I stood up. The limousine pulled up. The door opened. The rear left door opened. Yoko got out. John was far behind, say 20 feet, when he got out. I nodded to Yoko when she walked by me. She nod back? No, <clears throat> she didn't. Um, and I don't mean to be so clinical about this, but I've told it a number of times. I hope you understand. John came out, and he looked at me, and, and I think he recognized, here's the fella that I signed the album earlier. And uh, he walked past me. I took five steps toward the street, turned, withdrew my Charter Arms 38, and fired five shots into his back. What, uh, had you shot that weapon before? That weapon, no. Um, I didn't even know if the bullets were going to work. And when they worked, I remember thinking, they're working, they're working. I was worried that the plane in the baggage compartment, the humidity had ruined them. And I remember thinking, they're working. What did Yoko do? She, naturally, and I can't blame her, she dashed around the stair area. I don't know if it's still there at the Dakota today, but she just, you know, ran for cover, which is what anyone would do. Mm -hmm. John, uh, according to, to what I've been told, stumbled up the stairs, and then I saw her come back around and then go up to the stairs, and then she cradled his body. Did he, did she scream? I don't think she screamed, but a few minutes after that, there was a, just a blood-curdling scream from someone, and it put the hair on the back of my neck straight up. Were you uh, relieved? No. I, what happened was I was in a... What happened before the shooting, before I pulled the trigger and after, were two different uh, scenes in my mind. Before, everything was like dead calm, and I was... Uh, ready for this to happen. I even heard a voice, my own, inside of me say, do it, do it, do it. You know, here we go. And then afterwards, it was like the film strip broke. I fell in upon myself. I, I like went into a state of shock. I stood there with the gun hanging limply down on my right side. And Jose the doorman came over and he's crying and he's grabbing my arm and he's shaking my arm and he shook the gun right out of my hand, which is a very brave thing to do to an armed person. And he kicked the gun across the, the pavement and had somebody take it away. And I was just, I was stunned. I didn't know what to do. I took the catch in the rye out of my pocket. I paced, I tried to read it. I, I just couldn't wait, Larry, until those police got there. I was just devastated. 